Hello, my name is Dr. Tom Bennett from Kane University in the Battleship New Jersey Oral History Project. Today is July uh, 13th, the year 2007, and we're aboard the Battleship New Jersey, which is harbored in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, today I'm interviewing Mr. Robert Carmit, uh, who served aboard uh, ships during the uh, Korean War period. He served aboard the USS Cabot CBL-28 from 1951 to 53. That was a light carrier. He served aboard the USS Albany CA-123 from uh, March 1953 until May 1953. That was a cruiser. And finally, he finished his service in the Navy aboard the USS Missouri BB-63, uh, a sister battleship to the uh, New Jersey. He served there from May 1953 until uh, July 1953. And I must say, today I'm uh, being assisted by Mr. Dallas Barr, who is an intern, uh, worked with us on the ship from um, Camden, New Jersey. Um, Bob, thank you for, so much for being with us today, first of all. My pleasure. Tell us, how did you get involved with the Navy? I was <clears throat> always interested in the Navy, and when I was going to uh, Penn State uh, in my uh, sophomore year, uh, I looked into joining the Naval Reserve at the uh, Willow Grove Naval Air Station in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and that's what I did. I signed up uh, as a reservist. And did you, uh, did you then graduate college and then go into the Navy? No, I, <clears throat> I finished uh, two years of my college credits and then I applied for active duty. And I was uh, ordered to uh, Pensacola, Florida, where I went aboard the uh, USS Cabot. And I see that you're trained as a, a third, your third class aerographer. Talk to us a little bit about that training to become an aerographer and what you did as an aerographer before we talk about the ships. <clears throat> well, my, <clears throat> my aerography training started when I was in the reserve at the Willow Grove Naval Air Station and it involved the basic study of uh, cloud formations, uh, storm formations, recording uh, weather information for analysis, and also uh, getting into the uh, forecasting of weather as well. And we also were involved in uh, reading instruments uh, in order to record temperature, dew point, and other information necessary to our forecast. Um, and was the training um, uh, through formal classes, or is it uh, so, sort of on-the-job training through somebody who was an aerographer? It was a combination of both. We had uh, formal classes, and we also uh, engaged in hands-on operation uh, with the operation of the uh, Naval Air Station at Willow Grove. Um, I've interviewed an aerographer who served during World War II, and you served during the Korean War period. Um, was there any change in, in weather knowledge of the Navy between World War II to the Korean War that you're aware of? As <clears throat> Excuse me, as a result of the uh, Typhoon Cobra, which resulted in the loss of three uh, destroyers and 800 men and over 125 aircraft, the Navy uh, became aware of the importance of uh, aerology and the forecasting of weather, uh, not only for the safety of the naval personnel involved, but also for the equipment that they were operating. And so from the Second World War, uh, going on through the uh, Korean War and then on into the Vietnam experience, uh, individual ship commanders were indoctrinated with, with much more uh, sophisticated training in regard to 
forecasting the weather in the immediate vicinity of their naval unit. And I think that was the, the biggest change that took place. And it's an ongoing uh, endeavor because uh, equipment and technology are evolving all the time. And the weather is, uh, the weather involves uh, many variable aspects which are constantly changing too. So it's a, a challenging study. And we should mention for the historical record that uh, the storm called Cobra uh, took place in December 1944, which hit Admiral Halsey's fleet in the Western Pacific, uh, near the Philippines, I believe it was, and where three destroyers were flipped over and, and they lost 800 to 900 men in that horrible situation. Um, so you then are assigned aboard your first ship, the USS Cabot, the light carrier, as an aerographer? Yes, I was. And what did you, talk to us a little bit about your work as an aerographer, and then we'll talk a little bit about the ship, the Cabot itself. The shipboard aerology involved 24-7 uh, forecasting of weather. And as long as the ship was at sea, uh, there was a uh, crew of aerographers on duty recording hourly information such as barometric pressure, temperature, dew point, and this information was uh, accumulated with the intention of producing a weather map twice a day which would give the uh, aircraft operation uh, people the necessary information to uh, decide when and where they were going to operate uh, and launch their aircraft. When you were aboard the, the Cabot in 1951 to 53, uh, where did that ship serve in the Atlantic or Pacific Theater? The Cabot was stationed in Pensacola, Florida, uh, which of course is on the East Coast. Uh, and it was uh, the Naval Air Training Carrier for the uh, Naval Air Training Command uh, based in Pensacola. And you then therefore would sail in the Caribbean area off the coast of Florida? Yes. Normal operation area? Yeah, we operated daily out of uh, Pensacola and the <clears throat> uh, student pilots who were uh, qualifying for their carrier landings would uh, board the ship in the morning before we sailed and then uh, six of their classmates would fly three aircraft, uh, SNJs we called them, uh, out to the carrier and those six student pilots would qualify for their three landings and as they did uh, one of the student pilots aboard the ship would then uh, take over the airplane and shoot his landings and in that way we qualified I would say more than likely 24 student pilots during a, uh, a daily operation. And what does the term SNJ stand for? This was the Navy designator for a two-placed trainer aircraft. Was it, it was jet or it was jet aircraft by this time, I assume? No, we're talking 1952. This was still uh, prop jet or prop uh, driven. Now, as far as the weather goes um, in your training, was the weather different, say, off the coast of Florida versus in the North Atlantic or in the Pacific? Would you have to look out for different things as an aerographer? The weather in the, in the Gulf of Mexico off the southern coast of the United States, of course, was influenced by the uh, closeness of, to the equator, where, whereas when we operated in the North Atlantic near Greenland and Newfoundland, uh, we were operating in cold weather circumstances, which involved uh, a different approach 
most of the time in the North Atlantic you were operating in storm conditions and this would either uh, make flight operations impossible or marginal to say the least. Um, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, July 12th, the year 2007, there was a terrible typhoon that hit Okinawa. Um, have you ever had any experiences with typhoons during your career in the Navy? No. <clears throat> the typhoon is a term which is used to describe the hurricanes in the western Pacific. Uh, in the Atlantic we call them hurricanes, but they basically are uh, cyclonic storms. And I personally didn't have any experience uh, with uh, specific storms, but operating out of uh, Naval Air Station Pensacola the authorities had to anticipate that these storms would occur, especially in the southeastern part of the United States. And so they would conduct what they called hurricane flyaways periodically. And this would involve all the pilots and all the aircraft on the airfields which were uh, immediately adjacent to the Gulf of New Mexico and they would fly the planes out to airfields uh, further inland in order to uh, protect them from the hurricane winds and storms. Good. Now, is there anything else about aerography that as a non-aerographer who's interested in it that I should know about or that people 50 or 100 years from now should know about when they listen to this interview? As I mentioned previously, the study of aerology and the weather is a rather complicated subject and very unpredictable. Uh, we would forecast weather uh, with the expectation that the forecast would hold. However, in many cases, one of the many aspects that we utilize to forecast the the uh, weather would change and of course this could and in many cases did change the forecast. So you had to be prepared at all times to be flexible in adjusting your uh, forecast to uh, agree with the conditions which were in existence at the time. Let's switch and look at the th several ships that you served on. Talk a little bit about those. The first ship was the USS Cabot, CVL-28, a light cruiser, uh, from 1951 to 53. Talk to me a little bit about that ship. You mentioned before the interview that it was a cruiser converted to a carrier. And when was that done? The uh, USS Cabot initially uh, was constructed as a light cruiser and she had the uh, propulsion equipment which would uh, enable a light cruiser to maintain the speeds in excess of 30 knots and shortly after the start of the Second World War in the Pacific the naval authorities began to recognize the importance of aircraft carriers and the operation of naval aircraft in combating the Japanese Navy. And so the <clears throat> decision was made to convert nine uh, cruiser hulls which were nearing completion to uh, light carriers. And this was done and the cabot eventually served in the South Pacific and <clears throat> was included in what the Navy referred to as fast carrier task groups because the uh, propulsion equipment that these previous cruiser hulls uh, operated with enabled them to keep up with the fleet carriers which could go in excess of 30 knots. 
And so this contributed early on in the very start of the Second War to our ability to combat the Japanese uh, until we could uh, prepare and uh, put into operation the fleet carriers, which uh, eventually contributed mightily to the defeat of the Japanese naval forces. And to be correct, the fleet carriers would be of the Essex class, the larger carrier, correct? Exactly right. Now, for the <laughs> historical record also, what is the difference between a light carrier and a jeep carrier that was used in World War II? The jeep carriers were built on essentially uh, liberty ship hulls. These were referred to as liberty ships as a class. They were designed to transport uh, supplies and uh, keep the uh, warfront supplied with the equipment necessary to continue the battle. And the jeep carriers were able to be constructed quickly and they served primarily in convoy duty protecting the convoy ships of uh, supply ships, uh, tankers and so forth. Uh, essentially in the Atlantic they were utilized. They, they were not utilized as much in the Pacific. Okay. Um, talk to me then a little bit about your experiences aboard the, uh, the Cabot. You worked as an aerographer. What was life like aboard the ship? Life aboard a Navy ship is uh, an interesting uh, mixture of uh, inconvenience and closeness uh, with other crew members, which requires a certain amount of adjustment. Uh, privacy is non-existent, and uh, the food was excellent. I never had a problem uh, concerning food. <coughs> when we operated at sea, we were on duty four hours and off eight. And uh, after a while, you got, uh, you got used to the routine. Uh, some people experienced seasickness. Uh, I fortunately didn't encounter this. <coughs> and we also had uh, how shall I call it? An exciting life because when an aircraft carrier is in operation and launching and recovering aircraft, uh, it is an exciting time and anything can happen. We did have several crashes. Uh, and then, of course, we had to uh, uh, react to those and continue our operations. And so it, it was a, an ever-changing lifestyle. Um, why, would some, why would crashes occur aboard a carrier? I know it's a very dangerous job landing an aircraft and working on the deck crew, but why would, what were some of the crashes uh, what caused them? Well, there are many different reasons why uh, an airplane would crash uh, primarily. Uh, it would be occurring when the, the aircraft was landing or being recovered, <clears throat> and it could occur that the uh, plane will miss the cable with its arresting hook, and then it can only be stopped by hitting the barrier, which is erected amidship, but in many cases the barrier would not be rigged. And so if a pilot did miss the arresting cable, uh, he would have to gun his engine and fly off and uh, make another approach. Weather can have something to do with uh, the crashes. When we were in the North Atlantic, we had a, an F4U Corsair uh, crash on the uh, starboard side of the ship. The pilot was recovered, but the aircraft was totaled. And in 
the Gulf when we were operating as a training carrier. We had uh, accidents there primarily because of lack of experience of the student pilots. When a crash occurs, do they do run an investigation? Or do they write, I guess there's a report written, but is there any type of formal investigation that you would know of? I didn't have any actual experience or uh, contact with that, but there would be an investigation. And uh, of course, the Navy was interested in determining the reason for uh, any crashes and also uh, would be interested in injuries or fatalities uh, so that they could correct them and prevent them from happening in the future. By the way, while you're aboard the Cabot and other ships, uh, was it your experience, of course you would have an urologist uh, officer aboard, I assume. Yes, we would. Uh, would the captain, did the captains in general of the ships rely on you a great deal? Because I've read that not all captains were that interested in urology. Uh, some would, some would not follow what the urologer, officer, and crew would say. What was your experience on these ships? I didn't find that uh, the captains of any of the ships that I served on uh, took an active interest in the uh, development of the forecast that we were responsible for. However, <clears throat> our duty was to prepare the forecasts and submit them to the officer of the deck and then he would incorporate them into his operations whether he was uh, merely uh, operating the ship in moving from one location to another or whether he was actually engaged in flight operations. Now, is there anything else you'd like to say about your duty aboard the Cabot before we move on to your second duty ship, the Albany? Well, of the three ships that I served on, the, the Cabot was the most interesting. and I spent most of my time at sea with the Cabot, so that's when I, I gained most of my sea duty time. As a for my own personal interest as a former Marine, I assume you had Marine pilots also doing uh, test landings aboard the ship as they're qualifying? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, our, our uh, well, I, I stand corrected on that. We did engage in a uh, cold weather operation with a squadron of Marine helicopters. And the idea was for us to uh, transport them up to the uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Greenland area because that climate would be comparable to the climate that was in existence uh, in North Korea, which is when I was ser doing my service time. And this would enable these pilots uh, to experience the weather conditions which they were expected to uh, confront when they got into actual wartime operations out in the Pacific and uh, the Korean waters. Uh, well, let's move on to the Albany. Um, a cruiser served aboard it from uh, March 53 until May 53. What was your experience, what your experience aboard a cruiser? I was <clears throat> transferred not only from the Cabot to the Albany, but I also joined the uh, Admiral Staff of the Atlantic Fleet, and the Albany carried his flag. We uh, spent time in Jamaica and uh, really conduct, we did conduct uh, bombardment operations off the island of Vieques, which is southeast of Puerto Rico, and we did also uh, have liberty at uh, Guantanamo Bay, Navy guys call it Gitmo, and it was a short, relatively short cruise, and uh, then we returned to Norfolk. Now, how'd you get assigned to the, the Admiral staff? That's usually quite an honor. You must have done something right in your career. 
Well, apparently I did, but uh, I can't delineate why I was selected. I, I was an average uh, aerographer, but uh, I didn't question it because uh, when you were with the Admiral, uh, you went first class. Uh, we noticed a definite difference in our, our food when we were assigned with the Admiral's staff, and of course that was very agreeable. When you're with the Admiral's staff aboard a cruiser, uh, did you, did this, how many staff members were there, and did you sleep in a specific area together as a, as a group? Uh, no, we didn't stay in uh, any specific quarters. Uh, we were assigned among the uh, crew, and uh, I would say that his staff usually involved more than likely about 15 officers and uh, anywhere from 35 to 50 crew members in various functions. And one of those officers would be an aerographer? Yes, sir. An aerologist. And, uh, so there would be an urologist stationed with the ship's crew, and then there would be an urologist officer working for the fleet admiral then. Exactly. And who would uh, have more power, so to speak, in making decisions about weather? Would it be the ship urologist or the fleet admiral's urologist? There again, it would be determined by the rank of the specific officers, but when you're dealing with a, a variable subject like weather, uh, I would expect that the ship aerology officer would welcome any input from the admiral's staff aerologist, and so it was more than likely a joint operation. Um, now you then went soon after that to the USS Missouri BB-63, battleship, sister battleship of the New Jersey. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And what happened? How'd you get transferred to there? Did you go with the uh, with another group, or what happened? The Missouri had recently returned from her duty in Korea and was uh, in dry dock at Norfolk in Virginia, and the ship was being overhauled and being prepared to take the graduating midshipman class from the Naval Academy on their annual cruise to South America. And so uh, I was transferred with the Admiral again to Missouri. And when she left the dry dock, we proceeded up to the Naval Academy, anchored out, and the uh, graduating class was brought out to the ship and then we returned to Norfolk and the ship was then uh, provisioned for the cruise to South America and I was detached uh, to the receiving station in Norfolk uh, since uh, my enlistment was almost up. Um, by the way, who is the admiral that you work for? Do you remember his name? I don't, honestly. Was he a good person, good fellow? Yes. Yeah, we had a very enjoyable relationship aboard. Um, and I'm in a minute, in a minute I'm going to ask uh, Dallas if he has any questions that you'd like to ask, too, so think about one or two. Um, you get out of the Navy. How did the Navy impact your life later on, 20 years after you're out of the Navy? Well, I had completed two years of uh, my college requirements for a degree and I found with my experience in the Navy that it was important to have uh, a good education. And so I uh, left the Navy with the purpose of uh, completing my de degree requirements and so I went to uh, night school because again I had to uh, uh, start earning money and shortly thereafter uh, I met and married my future wife and so I went to uh, night school for six years and obtained my degree from the 
University of La Salle. And so I, I attribute the desire and the energy to complete those academic requirements to the Navy. It, it inspired me to do that. What did you study at night school and what did that lead you into later on in life? Well, that represents a, a controversy, really. I, I went into what was known as a, an industrial management type of program. And when I graduated with my degree, uh, my background in the working world at that time was as a design draftsman. I worked in a, an engineering company uh, designing bridges and highways. But I, I didn't look forward to a future with that. And I eventually wound up in a sales career with the New York Life Insurance Company. And you're selling life insurance, um, other Life products. insurance, health insurance, uh, property and casualty insurance, investments, mutual funds, the complete range of financial products. Now we have uh, a student intern, Dallas Barr, with us. Dallas, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Go ahead well, and speak uh, loudly. Um, my first one would be for you, um, Mr. Bob, out of being on the ship and life on the ship and everything, you were in the Navy. Is there anything that you learned there in the Navy that you still apply to your life today? That's a, an interesting question. I, I think, generally speaking, uh, the discipline was the thing that uh, impressed me the most and I carried over into my civilian life because when you're in the naval service or any military service uh, you're expected to perform and your superiors are not going to be accepting excuses and so you become more committed to what you're going to do. If I can jump in real quickly, in my training in the Marines, I made a mistake one day and the captain in charge, I, he said, why'd you do that? I explained. He said, that's a reason, but that's not an excuse. Mm -hmm. We don't accept excuses in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir. I learned very quickly. There's a reason, but it's not an excuse. You're supposed to do what you do and do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Exactly right which is quite different than civilian experience. Civilian experience, you can have lots of excuses and not do it right five out of six times and still be successful, not in the military. I, I think another interesting observation that could be made about the military life is that if you find it uh, objectionable or you're unhappy in the military life, you just don't go home. If you're having a problem in adjusting to the uh, military life, uh, you have to adjust, and this is part of the learning experience. It is a regimented type of existence, and there are many areas which can create confrontational situations which you have to learn to deal with. And if you have problems doing that, then the military life may not be for you. Dallas, you have another question? Okay, and speak loudly again. And um, if, there was, if there was one thing that you could tell um, uh, another kid who wanted to go into the Navy, what would that be? The Navy, provides a lot of opportunity in many different fields. And while I didn't utilize the specific training that I had in weather forecasting in my civilian op occupation, the uh, discipline and the uh, activities, generally speaking, uh, I call on throughout my career. And I think the most important thing that uh, a young person could uh, consider when they're expecting to go into the military service is to 
find out exactly what those opportunities are and then possibly make a selection which you can utilize in your uh, civilian career when you leave the military. Now I know that Dallas is currently in high school and he's interested in going to college and then going to Marine Corps officer school. Officer school. Uh, as a former enlisted man, what would you say to a possible future officer about enlisted people that he should know about so that when he becomes an officer, he may know how to work with these people better? That's a very important relationship. And in the Naval Service, I know that we referred to an officer having privileges and having responsibilities. And of course, the privileges are earned and the responsibilities are transformed into the relationships that that officer has with the enlisted men that he is uh, commanding. And so uh, an officer has a fine line to walk. He has to provide the discipline to get the job done, but at the same time, he has to be able to uh, commiserate with the men that he is commanding and understand their problems and try to be as compassionate as possible without becoming a buddy. Many officers make that mistake. They try to uh, become the buddy of the men that they command and that can't happen if you expect to retain their respect. Did you find, especially young officers, that they make mistakes? If you got a new ensign aboard that might be in charge or you had to work with, did you find they had some still rough edges that had to be worked out before they became effective officers? Ensign would be the first level officer, much like a second lieutenant in the Marines would be. Yes, that, that occurred quite often, especially at, uh, when you were operating at sea, because there were many uh, aspects of uh, the sea duty that would be different than you would encounter uh, on a shore base. But the younger officers uh, in the naval service had, a, uh, had access to uh, the chief petty officers of the Navy. And most naval men will tell you that the chiefs were the backbone of the Navy, and they were prepared to pass on this training and information and experience that they had to younger officers. Unfortunately, some younger officers, because they were blinded by their commission or their rank, uh, weren't uh, receptive to the training or the advice, if you will, of the chiefs. And so they had a much more difficult time. Chiefs can help or they can hinder. And it's up to the commissioned officer to decide whether he's going to accept that help or he's going to blunder on until he finally recognizes that he is making mistakes and that he does need assistance. That's what I found when I was in the Marines. Uh, the sergeants helped me a lot when I took over my first unit and the second unit. They, they, would, they knew they're there to help train you and make you a better officer. If, and there, a lot of the sergeants and chiefs in the Navy are very professional people and they're very interested you know, in their careers and in the military they represent. And there are some very good people. Did you find um, that the officers generally treated the enlisted men with enough respect? Or did they ever, because they had that gold bar of an ensign on them when they first came out, especially from the Naval Academy, did they not respect the men the way they should have? I never had any uh, adverse, re, re, uh, adverse uh, experiences in that regard. Uh, 
the officers that uh, I encountered, I, I respected, and uh, we had a good relationship. And if you did come across an officer who you possibly expected or had a problem with, it would be up to you to uh, adjust because he is the authority. And you're not going to take that authority away from him. It may be, he may be abusing that authority, but if he is, uh, you can't stop it unless uh, you learn how to deal with it. Good. Bob, before we finish up the interview, is there anything that you think for the historical record, and I'm interested in the historical record the next 50, 100, 200 years, that people should know about anything? at this point that I might not have asked about that's important. One of the things that I have incorporated into my tour aboard the Battleship New Jersey is a, a statement to the people who uh, come to the ship to see what it's all about. And I tell them that part of our mission as tour guides is to pass on to the young people especially the importance of these ships and the men who served on them in the maintenance of our liberty and freedom. And the only way, not the only way, but one of the most important ways that they can uh, gain that experience is by participating in our overnight encampments. And they come aboard, they are assigned a bunk, they have a hot meal, they take many tours of the ship, they sleep over, in the following morning they participate in a color ceremony and get a hot breakfast, and then they depart the ship. And this is an entirely new experience to a lot of young people, and it's about as close as you can get to actually serving in the Navy. And I think this is important for our young people to be made aware of uh, the importance of the Naval Service. Good. Well, thank you, Bob. Today, July 13th, the t year 2007, for the Battleship New Jersey, I've been talking with Mr. Robert Carmet Jr., who served aboard the USS Cabot, USS Albany, USS Missouri during the early 1950s. And of course today is one of our very finely trained docents aboard the battleship who comes down as a volunteer, I might say, and in many ways still serves his country by helping the civilian population understanding the life of the military bit and its important role that it plays in our history in the past and, and especially today. Bob, thank you so much for the interview.